Hello and welcome to the Global Antitrust Institute's online lecture series. I am John Yoon, and today we will be covering cost. Just to motivate the analysis, um, I'm going to give a quote from a seminal antitrust case, US versus Microsoft, 2001 DC Circuit. We decide this case against the backdrop of significant debate amongst academics and practitioners over the extent to which old economy section two Sherman Act monopolization doctrines should apply to firms competing in dynamic technological markets characterized by network effects. So what is a firm? We're gonna start with a very basic definition, but I think a very useful one. Firms are organizations that seek to make profits by turning inputs into outputs. So we're gonna focus in on the profit element as well as the input to output element. And, you know, while basic, it kind of sums it up, right? Take something as complicated as Amazon. They use servers, software, data, warehouses to sell books, music, television, slime, which my girls love. Um, BMW takes, you know, steel, plastic, aluminum to make uh, luxury automobiles, right? Inputs to outputs. And the idea of what is a firm is a huge topic and it's uh, a big part of industrial organization, which is a branch of economics that really looks at uh, firms and how they compete with each other and interact with each other. And so Ronald Close asked a very important question, why are there firms, right? And so a deeper dive into that will give sort of richer predictions, but um, this definition certainly will get us a long ways. Okay, profit maximization. This is a central assumption uh, for producer theory. Um, so what is a firm? A firm is attempting to profit maximize and it's comprised of two components, which is total revenue and total cost. Um, and so typically uh, we depict profit with, um, with pi, the Greek letter pi, and total revenue is TR and total cost is TC. We're gonna use a, that abbreviation uh, throughout today. An alternative way in which you can state this is that uh, firms are trying to minimize total costs for a given level of quantity or output. Um, now, production isn't limited to firms, right? Households, government, non nonprofits, schools, universities are all engaging in some degree of production, if you will, often in services. So this gets a little bit into some nomenclature. Services are sort of intangible products. Um, you know, when you go get advice or uh, get a consultation, that's, you know, that's a product, but it's intangible. Um, where something tangible we call goods or, and more generally we call either service or a good product. So products is the most generic term that you can use. So how do we go about measuring economic profit? Well, so again, let's look at the two components, total revenue, which is just the product of the price that you can get for your product times how much you sell. That makes a lot of sense and very intuitive. Total cost is what we consider opportunity cost. And perhaps you've run across this term, uh, but generally speaking outside of economics, nobody uses this term. Uh, but it's a very important concept in economics because it's really capturing the full cost of certain types of behaviors and activities. So this is a quote from Hines economic way of thinking, which I like, it says, costs are tied to actions, decisions, and choices. Let me work through two examples. Suppose that you miss a 730 train and you really needed to catch that train for an 8 a.m. interview. So what did the missed train cost you? Well, certainly you had to buy a ticket for the train and it's not very useful for you since you missed it. Uh, maybe you still go into the city to do something else, but that's a cost, certainly, right? That out-of-pocket cost. But I think we all realize you something else is super costly about missing that train, which is you lost that opportunity to interview for that job. And while it doesn't have a market value per se, it has a value to you. It gets more difficult to find an actual value without a market price, but there is one. Suppose, you know, some guy approaches you at the platform and says, hey, how much would it take for me to have you not go to that interview because my nephew is also interviewing and I don't want you to interview, right? If you give a true revelation of your reservation price, if you will, that's the value um, to you for 
from that interview. Now, that's a little creepy example, but it sort of gets at that idea that it is costly and it has some value to you. Um, a more conventional example, let's say that you take out Korean barbecue, which you should always be doing, right? And you, you, you buy enough for, for roommates or, or family. And the action of purchasing it is the opportunity cost, right? When you go there and you sort of literally take out the $40 from your wallet and hand it over, that's what it costs you to bring that food home. It also costs you time to go get it, but let's hold off that for the moment, right? So what did the act of purchasing takeout cost you? And so this is trying to make it more about an action, a, a decision, because when you make one choice over another, you're comparing counterfactuals and sort of how well off you are in each of those counterfactuals. And that's why the Hind definition is particularly useful to understanding a cost or opportunity cost. Uh, sort of a more conventional view of opportunity cost is breaking it up into its two components of explicit costs and implicit costs. Explicit costs require a direct outlay of money. Um, this is what we would conventionally think of a firm having to pay salaries, cost of materials, uh, renting equipment. Um, implicit costs do not require a direct outlay of money. This is the value of your time. And also, let's say capital equipment in which you own um, and you wouldn't sort of normally consider an ongoing cost. Let's say that you run a business from your home and you sell something off of Etsy and you use sort of stuff that you have around the house and your printer and your, your computer. When someone says, how much does it cost you to run the business? You're probably not thinking of those, those things, but let's say that you start expanding and you buy more computers and printers and certainly that's a cost, but after a few years, you probably won't consider it a cost. But um, if you shut your business down, you probably wouldn't have all those computers and printers around. You would probably sell them, right? So that's an opportunity cost of staying in business is that you give up that chance or opportunity to actually you know, sell or, or rent the equipment that you've bought, right? So it's really capturing that full uh, cost of being in a, one situation versus another. So when economists say that economic profits are zero, it's something quite different than when you know, an accountant would say that economic or profits are zero. Because for an accountant, they're looking at explicit costs. For economists, we're looking at both explicit and implicit costs or the full opportunity cost. So accounting co profits will, will be greater than or equal to economic profits. And so it's a very common misunderstanding. A lot of models assume profits are equal to zero. But that's actually a pretty good situation. That means all the factors of production or inputs are getting their full return relative to an alternative situation. So everyone's getting their full opportunity cost. A related and important idea uh, is this idea of a sunk cost. And these are costs incurred in the past, thus they have no relevance for evaluating future decisions. And this isn't the same as, as you paid for your computer before and so you don't consider it going forward. Well, that computer still has value in terms of, of you still own that computer and you could get something from that computer. Here, it's a little bit different. Let me work through a couple examples. Let's say that you apply for college. That decision to apply to a certain school, you would look at their application fee is one of the things that you would look at, right? That's a consideration. Um, and if it's super high or low, it can also you start to calibrate your decision based off of that. So it's relevant to you. But let's say that you go ahead and pay it and you've applied, your decision whether or not to go to that school is no longer dependent on that application fee that you've paid for already because that's a sunk cost. So another way of thinking about it is this fee isn't yours anymore. You don't own it to make a decision over it, right? You've handed it over to the school and they have ownership over it. So it's no longer in your calculus when you make uh, decisions going forward. Another example, let's say that you go to uh, a restaurant, you pay $5, you get their dessert, and it's terrible, right? That $5 is a sunk cost, holding aside that you can return the cook cookies and, and get your money back. Um, it's a sunk cost because you no longer own those $5. Uh, it's not yours anymore. Now you own the cookies. Um, so congratulations, cookies that you don't like. But your decision whether or not to take another bite is really now dependent purely on your marginal benefit 
uh, as long as it's greater than zero, you're going to take another bite. And maybe you will. You're like, I don't like it, but I need a little dessert. So let's turn to this idea, the second part of the definition. We focus a little bit on profit to um, turning inputs into outputs, right? That's what we said a firm is. So how do we begin to gain insight into this process? Well, we're going to use a model. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, oh, you know, uh, models, I'm going to roll my eyes at that. And yes, there are good models and bad models. And the way that we judge a model isn't how realistic it is, but how useful it is. Or often it's not even how completely accurate it is. Of course, we want accuracy. And so that, don't get me wrong, but it's really about usefulness in terms of a model. And sometimes that means being really accurate, or sometimes it means just being directionally right. And so um, we're going to model this inputs into outputs with a production function. And what this is, is a relationship between the quantities of inputs used and the maximum quantity of output that can be produced. And so the way that we sort of look and model a production function, at least at this stage, is that we take all these inputs, we put it into a black box. We don't really describe that process in which someone makes inputs into outputs but rather we're more interested in that relationship between the various inputs and how many inputs that you're using and cost in terms of making that output. So it's not that we're completely uninterested about the process, it's just the actual details of a specific pr production process to make um, books, for example, isn't something that we're modeling. Although Ronald Coase, black box can only take you so far, right? So um, to get a, a sort of a richer understanding of firm conduct, we need to sort of peel back that or look inside the box, if you will. So I'm going to work through uh, an example and um, uh, hopefully it's a good one because we're going to use a lot, use it for the rest of, of this, of this session. So let's say that catching lobsters is Q. Lobsters is the output and it requires uh, as a paradigm, two inputs, labor and capital, right? And the capital could be boats and, and uh, the lobster traps. So we would say quantity is a function of labor and capital, right? Those two things go into some production process to give you that, that output. So for the moment, let's say that capital is fixed. You only have a fixed number of boats, a fixed number of lobster traps. But what we can vary is output in terms of output to get more output is labor. So as we increase labor, uh, we would typically expect to get more output. And so this is where what we call, at least in the context of cost, the short run. When you hold one input constant, typically we hold a uh, capital constant, but vary a, a labor, that's a short run. When we can vary both inputs or however many inputs that you have in your model, we would call that the long run. So um, in an effort to be super fancy, I just drew this, um, this production function. So we're just taking that Q is a function of labor and capital and the bar over capital just depicts that it's being held constant. Here on the X axis, we're gonna look at labor, L, and the Y axis, we're looking at quantity output. And so what is a production function? It's that relationship between uh, inputs to outputs. So here you can see that going up to L prime, uh, as you increase labor, it's increasing output at an increasing rate. But after L prime, it hits a certain, what we call diminishing returns, where additional units of labor certainly increases output, but at a decreasing rate. And so this idea of a diminishing returns to labor is a very important concept in economics, right? And so the definition is each marginal unit of labor brings less new output than the previous unit of labor. That doesn't mean it's less than zero. It just means the increase isn't as high as the prior increase. So in other words, at some point with a fixed amount of capital, the marginal product of labor, MPL, starts to decline where the marginal product of labor can uh, be represented as the, 
the relationship in terms of the change in output from a change in input. So why is this important? Well, if we recognize that inputs such as labor have an opportunity cost, typically we, we think of that as wages, then it's taking more and more units of labor to get a given level of output. So what does that translate into? Well, in terms of cost, as you're using more and more labor, you're using more and more cost, if you will, or cost more and more money to make that same level of output. And so we're starting to get a sense of how cost relates to labor. So here's uh, a table. I know there's a lot of numbers, but it's a very simple breakdown if we look at it. At the far left, I'm just looking at the units of labor. We're going from zero to five units of labor. And uh, the next column over means that as we increase labor, as we would expect, the, the yield, how much lobster that we catch in a day, increases, right? The first unit brings 10, and then it goes up all the way to 30 with, the, with five units. Marginal product is just that additional um, amount that each unit of labor brings. So that going from zero to one, we can see that first uh, uh, fisherman brought in, I think they're called lobster fishermen, um, brings in 10. The next person brings in an additional eight, so the total moves up to 18. The third brings six, so the total moves to 24, et cetera. But you can see right here that the marginal product of labor is declining, and that's the diminishing returns that I've built in here. The fixed cost of capital, let's say that you rent the equipment of the boat and the, the, the traps, you can see that remains constant at $1,000 for the day. It doesn't matter how much you catch. That's that fixed element. And let's say that each person uh, gets a wage of $150 a day. And so you can see that the total cost of labor will be 150 for the first unit all the way to $750 uh, for five units of labor. And total cost is just a summation of both the fixed cost and the variable cost of labor. So uh, as I just mentioned, we can represent cost uh, in the short run into two components, right? So um, that's a fixed and a variable component. And as I mentioned, the fixed component is that component that captures the, uh, the, the input that doesn't change. In this case, it's capital and the capital expenditure of $1,000. That's the fixed cost. The variable costs are those that change uh, with the variable unit. Here in this case, it's labor. And so that summation of those two costs gives us total costs. Now, when you have totals, you can do averages. And average in this context is dividing by Q, right? You take your total cost that it makes, that you have to expend to make a certain level of output. And you want to know on average how much each unit costs you, you divide by Q. We do that for fixed. We do that for variable. We do that for total. And so the sum of the average fixed cost with the average variable cost is, the sum, is your average total cost. Let me point you towards average fixed costs in this particular example. It would be 1,000 divided by Q. And so you can see that as you expand Q, the average fixed cost is going to fall. In, in another way of saying it is you're spreading that cost over more and more output. And that sounds like, and it typically is a very good thing. Now here, uh, it's the same, same information, but a little bit more I've thrown into averages. And I've dropped the labor part because um, we've moved on from production to more of cost, which is relating it not necessarily to labor per se, but to quantity. So I've kept the quantity. It goes from zero to 30 as we increase the units of labor from, from one to five. And you can see that the average fixed cost, which is just the fixed cost of capital divided by how much you're making, is, is declining, right? We had this high cost of uh, on average of $100 to now it's 33 um, when you're making 30 units. The average variable cost is the same exercise, but you're taking the total variable cost, in this case, the cost of labor and divided by quantity. And then you sum those two, get the total. Um, notice that the average fixed cost is falling. The average variable cost is falling. So that means the average total cost is falling, but the average total cost actually hits its minimum, at least in, in, 
for the units that we, we see here, we don't see a continuous unit. We're kind of jumping as in the discrete levels of, of output. At the 28th unit, the average total cost is 57, but at the 30th unit, it's 58. Ooh, what's going on here? And what, what's, what's happening is that um, the average variable cost is increasing. I might've said it was decreasing just a second ago. It's increasing um, because of that diminishing returns. We're gonna see this better when we get into our next concept, which is marginal cost. This is a, probably the most important cost concept that, uh, that I can talk about today. And that's, that I will, can't talk, it's not like I'm hiding other cost concepts from you. There are others, but marginal cost is, is I'm, I think it's fair to say, is the most important cost concept. And what is marginal? Well, it's that additional cost that you uh, are incurring for each additional unit of output. So we represent that by change in TC divided by the change in Q. Notice the change in total cost is we can break it down into its two components of variable and fixed, but we know fixed doesn't change with output. So the change in total cost is really just the change in the variable cost. That's the only thing that can change. So marginal cost is really uh, the same as saying it's the change in variable cost over the change in output. Alternatively, uh, maybe a more intuitive way if this isn't really helping, Marginal cost is the dollar amount a firm saves by producing one less unit of output, right? If someone said to you, well, what if I don't make that next unit? How much do I save, right? That, that's your marginal cost. So here's that same table, but now I'm adding an additional column and that's the marginal cost. And so how did I get that? Let's go back to our definition. It's the change in the total cost from the change in Q. So, Remember, it can also just be the change in variable cost. I think it's a little easier to see. You can see that the, uh, the change in total cost from going from zero to, to 10 is, is, is $150, and the change in quantity was 10. And so the marginal cost per unit was 15. Uh, this might be even more intuitive. Let's go to that fifth unit of labor. Recall that fifth guy he brought extra lobster because, but you're, you're bumping into diminishing returns. And so all he did was increase the quantity from 28 units to 30. So he brought the marginal product of two additional lobsters. How much did this guy cost? $150, right? The cost of labor increased from 600 to 750. So another way of putting it is two lobsters cost you $150. So the marginal cost of those additional units of lobster was 75 each. Hopefully that makes some sense. Now, uh, I didn't dig deep into uh, diminishing returns because this is intended to be uh, a shorter lecture series, but very briefly, diminishing returns is really makes some sense. If you think of something like a coffee house where you have a set space, set number of machines, a set number of registers, even if you add more and more people back there, uh, yes, you're going to increase productivity after a couple of people, but then, you know, by five, six, seven people, they're just going to get in each other's way. And that's another way of thinking of diminishing returns. So here's the actual cost curves from our, our little example that we ran through. And let me uh, point your attention to the marginal cost curve, which is the blue curve. And you can see that as we're expanding our quantity on the x-axis, that our marginal cost is increasing. And that's because directly of this diminishing returns, meaning you got to squeeze that towel ever so harder to get that additional drop of water because you're at diminishing returns. So I'm hitting this diminishing returns on all angles. We're at a coffee shop, we're hitting, getting lobsters and we're squeezing towels. Um, you, the average fixed cost is falling. That's the orange curve. And that's a very common characteristic of probably most firms, but uh, in terms of the range of output for digital platforms. We typically think of digital platforms. What's the marginal cost to a search engine to serve up one more search to a user? Pretty much zero, 
right? They have this huge fixed cost of servers, algorithms, intellectual property, um, the data they use, right? This is a big production, but that's a huge fixed cost and they spread it over billions of searches or trillions of searches. And um, so each additional search is, is, is in terms of the average, it, it brings that, that fixed cost, average fixed cost down. And notice on the orange curve, you can see that it, it dips, but that average total cost is gonna start to go up. Why? Think of the marginal data point of a room full of people, but someone from the MBA steps in the room and, and someone says, oh, let's recalculate the average height in this room. What's gonna happen? That marginal data point is higher than the average in the room. And so it's gonna typically, I don't know, maybe it's a room full of other MBA players. So assuming we have normal height people and an MBA player comes in, right? It's gonna start pu pulling up that average and if the marginal data point is below, someone shorter comes in, that's gonna pull the average down, right? And so you can, you can see a little bit, it's gonna emerge, but a few graphs later, I'm gonna show it more in its totality, as the marginal cost goes up, it's gonna start pulling up that total cost. So this relationship between average total cost and average variable cost is sort of the basic paradigm we use when we draw, draw these U-shaped cost curves. It's not particularly U here, uh, it's kind of a flat U, but uh, this is that broad relationship. And it just goes back to that example we did earlier here. Um, these, those are, this is from the numbers that we developed. The average variable cost is the gray, and you can see it's below the average total because the total is a sum of the fixed and the variable. If you did the heights of the two, and you added them up, you would get the height of the total. And so we just draw the average total cost above the average variable cost. And so this actually gives us a lot of information, a lot of useful information. For a given level of output, um, each you go up to the curve, it tells you the level of the average total cost and the average variable cost. And it tells us even more actually. The product of that average variable cost with quantity is the, the level, the actual variable cost. Why? What's the average variable cost? It's equal to variable cost divided by the quantity. So if we take variable cost divided by quantity and multiply it by quantity, the quantities cancel out and we just get variable cost. And so for at, at a level of quantity zero, it also tells you the fixed cost because Again, the fixed cost is the difference between the average total cost and the variable cost, or another way of putting it is the sum of the two gives you your total cost. So there you have it. With the averages, you can also see the levels. That's very nice. Let me throw in the marginal cost. And again, it's shaped this way and it intersects at the minimum because just focusing on the total for the moment, um, it's that marginal data point, right? If the marginal data point is below the average, it's going to pull the average down. If the marginal data point is above the average, it's going to pull that average up. So this gets us to another important concept, is, which is economies of scale. And this is the relationship between the average, uh, in terms of the average total cost between, um, uh, let me restate that. Economies of scale is getting at effectively the shape of the average total cost curves. And so there's sort of different components of the shape. Uh, maybe you don't have all of these components in a given curve, but in our basic paradigm in a U-shaped cost curve, you do. First, you have increasing returns to scale, and we call this economies of scale. And then there's constant returns to scale, and there's decreasing returns to scale, or diseconomies of scale. You're probably thinking, why are there so many names? Uh, I don't know, but uh, the, it's most commonly known as economies of scale and diseconomies of scale. Rather than walking through that, let me show you the picture. Economies of scale is when the average total cost is falling. Diseconomies of scale is when the average total cost is increasing. And that's where the diminishing returns is really kicking in. Uh, economies of scale is really when that average fixed cost is dominating and starting to pull down. Or maybe the, the labor is super productive. It's increasing returns to the labor at that point. Final step, um, and we'll wrap this up. How do we get market supply, right? I've, we've been so focused on our cost. So first let's start with what is supply. From the perspective of a firm or group of firms, 
It's the amount they wish to sell at each positive price. Another way of putting it is, it's that relationship between price and quantity from the perspective of sellers. And it's derived from profit maximizing behavior. Recall, what is profits? It's total revenue minus total cost. And so how do you maximize that? Well, without walking through this, we can do it very intuitively. Um, what's the benefit of producing an additional unit of output? That's your marginal revenue, your additional revenue that you expect to get. What's the additional cost from producing another unit of output? Marginal cost, right? So you want to make a decision up until the point where the marginal revenue is uh, right equal to the marginal cost, right? As long as it's greater than marginal cost, you would want to keep making output. So what's another way that we can represent marginal revenue? Well, in a competitive market, what is the additional revenue you get from additional unit of output? It's your price. It's the price that you can get on the market, right? If I sell another unit, oh, I'll get, I'll get the price. How that price is determined, that's for, the, for a, another series. But here's our par paradigm of the short run cost curves of the U-shaped average total cost, variable cost, and the marginal cost. And let me just um, show you what different levels of price, I put price and cost all on the, the y-axis. It's, it's all dollars, but it means different things. And when the blue line is the price, but the marginal cost is your cost. And so what this marginal cost is telling you is that at every price here, a higher price, it tells you, you want to produce more. Why? Well, um, in order to produce more, you need to be compensated with a higher price. Why? Because your costs are higher, right? So if you get that higher price, you're willing to produce more. So again, profit maximizing behavior is where the price intersects or equals the marginal cost. And, and so that's what, what this marginal cost curve can tell you. Now I'm gonna focus in on this one and this will be the last point I make, is that notice that this last price is below the minimum average total cost, but above the average variable cost. Fortunately, I'm gonna just kind of run through this. This is, this is something that could, we could spend a great deal of time on and you're probably saying, please don't. Um, uh, but let me focus in on that last price again. It was below, it's between the average total cost and the average variable cost curve. Recall that each uh, level of output, you can uh, go up to each of those cost curves to tell you something about the levels. So what is total revenue? It's price times quantity. So that area is how much money you make um, in terms of, of the revenue. That's not bad, it looks pretty good. But what's your cost? Your cost is average total cost times quantity, right? The product of the two gives you the level. Let me just go back. There's your, your, your revenue, there's your cost. And you're thinking, why are you make, doing it? Just leave this business, you're not making any money. In fact, here's how much you're losing, right? That wedge between price and total cost. But recall, fixed costs are things you have to pay regardless, even if you make zero, you have to pay that fixed cost. And fixed cost we represent as the wedge between the total and the variable. And so as long as you meet some of that fixed cost, recall that uh, your revenues will not only hit your variable cost, but it's gonna hit some of your fixed costs, you should at least keep producing in the short run. Okay, so what does that tell us? The supply curve, meaning how much you wanna produce at each level of at each price is summarized by your marginal cost curve above that minimum average variable cost. You don't wanna produce below because then you're not even hitting your fixed cost nor your variable cost. So the market supply is the summation of each firm's individual supply curve. So firm one has a supply curve, firm two has a supply curve, and the market is just the horizontal summation of that. So let's say a price of $10, firm one wants to sell 10 units. Firm two also wants to sell 10 units. Well, on the market, that would mean 20 units. Thanks so much.